have you with us, Soph. And we've got a very special guest, all the way from WA, ultra <laughs> endurance cyclist, Jack Thompson. Jack, good to have you in the studios with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on board, guys. The big thing that you're sort of planning is the Tour de France. It's a three-week race, 21 days with two rest days. You are going to do the whole route in half the time while the race is on, correct? Correct, yeah. So essentially the concept is if it takes the Tour de France riders three weeks to ride the Tour, I'm going to give them a head start and I'm going to chase them down to Paris and I want to win the Tour de France. <laughs> Soph, is he mad? Yeah, uh, particularly <laughs> because next year's Tour I'm right. fucking nervous to be honest. Like I'm ready to... Like watching the Tour today, it feels like I'm almost like falling behind. Like they're still riding and I'm sitting on the couch watching it. I'm like, ah, come on, I need to start chasing. Actually doing this interview, like I almost feel more nervous because it's more real. So I'm like, it's quiet and I'm <laughs> looking out the window like, yeah, this time tomorrow we'll be, you know, 200 odd K away from here. It will be a bit of a blast from the past, but yeah, like I've got butterflies in the tummy and yeah, I think it's a good thing. Like if I wasn't nervous, there'd be something wrong. No, like, yeah. Yeah, bring on tomorrow morning. What do you hear this, ready? Oh. <laughs> this all started probably three years ago. And like as a, as a child, like I was always fascinated by the tour, like, you know, we, we would stay up late at night and we'd watch the tour and you know, these guys were like heroes for us. And I never had the opportunity to go and race like that. Like I was never good enough to go and race like that. And so anyway, the pathway that I've followed is taken me sort of into the ultra cycling. And so, you know, there's this idea like, what would happen if I actually could ride the Tour de France and do what I've always wanted to do, but do it in my own way. All right. Hey. See you boys. Mate, good luck. I've given the Tour de France a 10-day head start and tomorrow, 5th of July, I'll set off and ride the 2021 Tour de France. This sounds silly, but I almost forgotten it's the Tour. I look upon it as like a spreadsheet. 350 kilometers a day, 5,000 meters per day average climbing. Some days are more, some days are less. Feels good to get the win, boys. Cross that line first. <laughs> I can't imagine those guys racing up there, We'll probably be on the bike for 14 hours a day, I'd say. And there's around three hours a day on average of transfers in a car. So it's an apples for apples comparison of the Tour de France. Woo! Well done, mate. Wherever the riders have ridden, I'll ride. Fuck, what a miserable afternoon. Huh? Oh. Wherever the riders have jumped in the car and transferred, I'll jump in the car and transfer. We want to make it as similar to the Tour as we can and see essentially how fast can the Tour de France actually be ridden. I've got to be honest, I spent a fair whack of the ride thinking about Paris. It better, it better be good. <laughs> how does it look? Is it like a little cab salute? Because <laughs> I already had a celebration planned. Oh, did you? I was thinking here the piano man. I was gonna go to the odd salad stir. <laughs> did that, we'd have to drive there. But then the next round will be one and a half hours. We'll get a good night's sleep tomorrow. Yeah, we'll get a good no, sleep, no. I think. We should do that after. Yeah. It's like this is actually happening now. It's like pretty surreal. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, so it's nice to finally be able to, to, to get started. And I just hope it all goes to plan. Last night, whoa, bit of a whirlwind. We finished, basically jumped in the car, had a big bowl of pasta. The boys booked the hotel, all good to go. Knew that we'd um, get a good night's sleep. We'd finished a little bit, not a little bit earlier than we thought. And uh, we got there to find that there was a big expo on in town and the hotel we booked was no longer available, nor was any hotel in town. The completion of the stage before, and then the realization that, all right, we can't even get accommodation here. We have to keep going. 
I think that's when it, like it sunk in for all of us that like this isn't going to be a walk in the park like there's going to be stuff that happens here that we just have to adapt to. I forget what time we set off would have been 11:30 or something I guess. It dawned on me that the only uh, only option was to jump back on the bike, ride the time trial and then transfer into the accommodation of the next stage. And I was ready for bed. And then let's get back out on your bike, mate, and hammer around the TT course, and then we're going to transfer for another two hours or three hours or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. All right, just send, send Jack over here then. Yeah, Jack's going to come up. OK. All right, we'll see you soon. Oh, I'll see right. you guys at the finish. That was the first realisation for all of us that, like, this is, this is only going to get more difficult from here. And it was almost like a taste of things to come. It's like the roads are flooding back there. You can control how much you eat. You can control how hard you ride. You can't control what the weather's gonna do. That would go down there as probably one of the hardest days on the bike ever. I was so cold at one stage that I almost shivered myself off the bike. So I got a little bit dangerous at one stage and decided I had to uh, pull over and warm up a bit just because I felt as though I was doing damage. Nothing will ever complain about like a two or three hour ride in rain again. <laughs> annoying because you just can't enjoy it. Yeah. Definitely one of the things I've learnt doing these things is the importance of listening to the body and uh, today was a good, good example of that. In the past I would have just pushed on and dug myself a hole. If you had to describe the amazing chase in one word, it's like roller coaster. That's it. One word done. Easy. So you're like, yeah, these massive highs. And then two hours later they're followed by a massive low. And it's crazy, like the little things that bring you from absolute lows back up to like highs. Ready to be at the top. Yeah. yeah. What Pretty is there. it? Seven? In my head I thought it was ten, so there you go. I've done a cheeky three in my mind. It's the goal de la Colombia. So essentially like every day is gonna be completely different. And we go through some amazing landscapes, so uh, head across into the Alps and it'll be uh, different and then into the Pyrenees and then back up to, to Paris. Mm -hmm. When I think about the ride like that, like it is exciting because it is an adventure and I've essentially got, you know, five guys around me that are coming on an adventure with me. It's like we're gonna be living together for ten days on the road and like, you know, we're gonna be tired, we're gonna be grumpy, we're gonna be hungry, we're gonna be cold, we're gonna be hot, like we'll probably come out of this like all either really good mates or really fucking bad mates, you know, like not mates at all, so like it's more than just the riding that I enjoy. So like this is like an adventure, this is like a journey. And, you know, it's not adventure riding by any means, but like in its, it's an adventure in its own right. And I think that's pretty cool. Like so many things can happen on the road and I think that's like the, the exciting unknown aspect of it. about the transfers, that was easy. You got a nice relax, put your feet up, have a little <laughs> snooze. Oh, that made it nice, didn't it? I know, stress-free, didn't it? The transfers were like almost more stressful than the riding, I would say. The atmosphere yeah. in the car was like, it's not a good atmosphere because the guys are rushing to get to the next place. Like if I can explain it, it's like, all right, I finished riding 250 kilometers. And then it's like, before I can take a breath, I'm laying down, I'm shoving food in, 
The guys are arriving at 140 kilometers an hour down the, the motorway and in the back of the car rocking around. And then I try and just fall asleep for 10, 20 minutes. And then we're there and I've got to wake up, I've got to eat again, I've got to go again. And everyone's stressed about time. Like it's, uh, it's like, I feel stressed thinking about it. <laughs> like you can't even stop just to have a shit and check your phone or anything. Like you can't, there's no time. I underestimated like the, the stress of the transfers. I don't think anyone will realize how stressful they were but like they add to the fatigue. There's nothing easy about the transfers. The accommodations are probably one to two, one to two thousand euros a night. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the only thing there is. Yeah. No 1 a.m. check-in for those places. No, no. So where are we, how, how many k's long are we staying? On the next stage, yeah. 70. 70, so mm -hmm. you've got to ride 70 this evening. Yeah, well, we'll see, we need to make a decision once we get there. Like, it needs to be safe for everybody as well. Like, yeah. So, you know. And if he's completely cooked, it's fucking, we, we it's might super, as well do this extra 70 another day than today. Yeah. He was more alive there than he was earlier. He had, yeah. he had the white face with the sweat and it was like, yeah, yeah you're cooked. And I mean, you know, I remember when the guys told me like, oh yeah, 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 we think you should do a bit of the the Von Two stage. I was like, fucking serious? I was like, I'll get 350 if I just do the two. And then I'm like, yeah, 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 but you're behind. It's like, fuck. It's just a decision that I don't, I don't really want to have to make anymore. So I'm, I have to just leave it up to them. So the only thing I really want to think about is just riding. It's the first time I've actually really trusted them to make the call. I said to Zippy last night, I was like, I could keep going all night if I had to. Like, it's, it's not the problem. The problem is tomorrow. Do I wake up fucked? And then if I wake up fucked, then we're in trouble. It's just like there's so many things you've got to try and control. So it's, like the, it's always like this trade-off. It's like the, the biggest game of management you've ever played. Like we got in at three o'clock the night before and like I remember Zippy was pissed off that we were so late and then the next morning like everyone was just like almost like zombies. Oh, finally dry shoes. And you're happy right. that you've chipped off now from last night? Like now? Yeah. I don't think I ever, I don't think I'd ever be like unhappy that I chipped off more. Yeah. <laughs> And riding that section last night, that would have been a bit of a prick to ride this morning and then do one two. It's one two or Tormelay? One two. One two twice. Twice. Yeah. Have you ridden one two before? No. Have you like researched it? Or are you just gonna get on with it? I think it's all I know is that it's the one that looks like the moon. Von 2 was, in stark contrast to the days prior, warm, super warm. And it was, it was really like the first of the mountainish days, if I remember correctly. Von 2 itself is, is pretty special. Like growing up, having been lucky enough to go on like a ski holiday with family, it feels like you're at a ski resort, but it's like, forget the skiers and the snowboarders, it's cyclists. And there's people from like all walks of life and all different kits and all different bikes and all different ages. Yeah. Nobody cares what they're wearing or how they look. It's just people enjoying being on a bike and that's pretty special. For me, Von Tu was like a really dark place. It was the first time in the trip where I was like really struggling. Like I wasn't really enjoying even being on the bike. It was like, what am I fucking doing this for? You know, like, I'm not enjoying it. 
<laughs> Why? The first climb was alright because I had a guy that I rode with. That was the easier side and then this is the hard one. I didn't get much sleep last night. I'm in the box now. Zippy hopped out of the car and he rode the final couple of kilometers with me on the e-bike and he said to me like it doesn't really look like you're enjoying this and I just said I'm not I'm not really enjoying it like it's too stressful and like the nature of what I do is there are highs and lows and like looking back on a previous life I lived a life where there was massive highs and massive lows like if I if I take myself back to uh, like the darkest place I've ever been in it's sort of like a little bit daunting to go back there, but like, I don't mind going back there. It's 2000 and 2010, and I was like using a lot of drugs. Like my family weren't happy with me. I ended up in rehab for a little bit. Like my, I just think that my parents weren't happy with me. But like I came out the other side of that. And it was, like it was a rough patch, but. Yeah, I think now like I've, I've learned a lot from that. And it's definitely shaped me into who I am today. And so, yeah. Like I think when things get tough out on the bike, it's like nothing compared to that. So, yeah, like I'm pretty well prepared for this, I'd say. I think back then, like, I wasn't happy and I had, like, very, very dark thoughts, but, like, I never acted on them and I'm just, like, happy I never acted on them or I'd never be here today doing what I'm doing now. And it's, like, push through the difficult times and you'll come out the other side. It might be a year, it might be a week, but, yeah. And also so to surround yourself with good people, I think, yeah, having a good support network's really important, so. Yeah, recovery. You guys think the same? I definitely think today. Sure. Yeah. Because what we can do is to wake up tomorrow morning earlier. Wake up early and fresh. You're fucked now. You're, you're fairly tired today. And even if you feel good now. <laughs> I've never done that, huh? It's probably a good thing. Bring on Paris, mate. Bring it on. Yeah, this morning stage went really good. I was nervous this morning because I didn't really know how the body was going to be, to be honest. Yesterday was a fucking hard day. Mentally, probably more than physically. Anyway, got rolling this morning and just decided today I wasn't going to worry about any numbers on the uh, Wahoo, but rather just the, just the map. And it was actually really nice because I uh, just meant I could zone out a bit and really just enjoy where I was riding. So the 220k disappeared in what felt like only a couple of hours, which is always a good thing. I'm proud that the next day I could turn that around and be on a massive high. I think if you are, like if I'd been in this position three <laughs> or four years ago. I wouldn't have had like the mental capacity or the experience to actually do that. Like I probably would have quit. And for me that's like a, that shows how much I've progressed as like an athlete or as a person. It's knowing that like, you know, three years ago I wouldn't have been able to push through this and now I can. And it gives me a whole lot of 
self-confidence in whatever I set out to achieve next. It's like I know I can turn a difficult time around just like that. The sound of them yesterday said to be, I didn't have, I sort of lost track of that. And then I was talking to mum and dad. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're going to catch them tomorrow. <laughs> you're an incredible yeah. fight. I think as I get closer to the peloton, I think mentally that will be a nice feeling. Like, all right, I'm catching them. Like, this is becoming more real. Like, it's almost like a bit of uh, you know, the greyhounds and like the, the dogs have the hair to chase. It'll almost be that like sensation of there's something just in front of me. If I had to explain so that anyone sitting at home knew that sensation of what it felt like to actually pass the peloton, yeah, it's that sort of like feeling of like you're secretly doing something and in the morning no one's going to know you were there, but you've had this amazing experience. Can you take a picture with them? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the end. Well, we have to keep that's, that's the sensation I had. It's like... I'm at the biggest bike race in the world. No one really knows I'm here. I was thinking as well, like we've caught the peloton now, the next couple of days, just try and enjoy it. Yeah, it's a pretty cool feeling. Down we go. After the Andorra stage, when we actually passed the peloton, a real high point, because it was like the first point that I was in front. It was the first point that we had issues with getting through on the roads because the tour was coming. <laughs> Guys, surviving okay? Yeah. How much sleep are you uh, working on? About three hours. About three hours a night, no yeah. way. Bin bags on under my socks. I got rubber gloves on. This looks pretty ridiculous, but I'm sort of glad no one's going to see me out here. Like this last bit where the road was closed. Yeah. And people were like barbecuing and things. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. So you get the iPhone out and there's people like, yeah. We'll have to go have to nice. have a beer in Paris. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> be Climbed up a little climb and there's a bunch of people on the road. Simon Gerrans is there with uh, a couple of his media crew and they're cheering me on which was like for me pretty surreal because growing up like Simon was always someone like I idolised as a racer. Well thanks for coming out. No worries. At the time I didn't really realise but Simon's like put his hand out to shake my hand and I'm like I've gone to shake his and I've realised I've got like a rubber glove on and I've thought Jeez. fuck me like I've got a bin bag on underneath my helmet. I've just sh shook Simon Garen's hand with a rubber glove on and I've got a bin bag on my head. Like, what does he think of me? Like I was just too tired and too cold to care. Yeah, a whole lot of climbing in store for me. On already very tired legs, so. Yeah, I had my trusty yellow cap with me, which uh, the boys had collected from the from the previous night's finish. So I, I felt like I was uh, being guided by the yellow spirit. Tough day out, which culminated in, uh, yeah, one last long climb on the first stage of the day up to Fortet. which I'd have to say is probably the hardest climb I've done, just given the, the circumstances and the, the fatigue in the legs and the, everything put together. I actually didn't realise I was climbing Tourmalet yesterday until going up the Parasol, that bike packer guy was like, oh, you're doing the Tourmalet today? And I was like, oh, well, if that's in the next stage, then I guess I am. Tourmalet. On paper and in my mind, I thought, oh my God, like Tourmalet is going to be an absolute prick of a thing. I went through this town, right? And there's this like old lady on the side of the road and she's looking at me and she's like going like this, like thumbs up, pointing at the sky and like winking at me. And I was like, oh, it's like a, it's my guardian angel. <laughs> like I had found like a pretty nice rhythm and 
it had like a nice mix on and was climbing along the base of Tourmalade to sort of get into the base of the climb, feeling good actually. And then it yeah, started going up and it was quiet, it was the night. I was like, this is pretty good, like I'm finding a nice rhythm here. Yeah, like I'm, I'm enjoying it, like I'm climbing, like it feels like I'm flying up, I've got no real perspective because I can't see anything or I can really gauge anything on is like the way I feel and I feel pretty bloody good. It's misty and it's raining at this stage and it's cold, but because I'm climbing I'm, I'm hot and I'm just wearing my, my Knicks jersey and I don't even think I had, maybe I had short finger gloves on and I was in like another world like completely in my own little flow state. You know, like I ride the bike as a form of stress relief or as like a form of like meditation and so when it no longer felt like it was stress relief and in fact it was like bringing on stress during the trip it was a very weird position to be in because I've not associated the bike with that before. I remember you guys came up to me in the car as we were nearing the top. I remember Tristan said like, oh, this is like a bit dangerous, you shouldn't be doing this and I'm like, man, like, you want to do this and the next time. I'm just trying to get it done. Like at this particular point in the ride, like all I wanted to do was go back to that that position I was in, you know, as a 13 year old kid when I was, I'd get on a bike and I'd just ride because it was fun. So on paper, like that was a seriously hard climb, but like I got to the top of it and while the weather was just super shitty and we made the call, it was too dangerous to descend that night. What was ironic was that like, at the end of that stage, I felt good again. Like I'd found like that passion for the bike again. And I knew that I only had one more climb left to do after this on the trip. And so Tourmalet was like, certainly a, a high point for me. That final climb after Tourmalade. Yeah, it's like the calm before the storm, but we were like in front of the calm. So it was like a nice place to be. And it was nice to know that we only had really, or well, we had three more stages, but like the hard yakka stuff's out of the way. Mate, last climb of the whole, uh, the whole tour. Feels fucking good, huh? Yeah. And it's moments like this that I wish there was more time to cherish it. Wish. Good job, mate. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, just Probably Cheers. a couple of days. You think like we were at the top there and we got there, we get a couple of photos and then it's automatically back down. Like I'd have loved to have stopped at like the <laughs> Apres ski bar. <laughs> That's a good, look like, I look like a skier with a ski lift in the background, like an 80s skier. <laughs> yes. Why don't we just stop in here for a cheeky salad and a cold beverage? But it's like, nah, this trip's not about that. The trip's about riding long distances and pushing ourselves and the van couldn't come up, so I had to roll back down. And that rolling back down was like, like, you know, like I've done the hard work now, all I've got to do is enjoy the, the downhill. Coming into Paris, I knew that I had 60 kilometers to do basically around Paris, and then I had 60 odd kilometers to do up and down the Champs Elysees. And so my goal was let's just get to the Champs, and then it's like party time. The team was waiting on the side of the road. My partner Leia was there, and like everyone was there. And we actually had the specialized Creo that yeah. was um, we'd, we'd brought around with us. It's chaos going up, and it, but then coming down, it's pretty fun. Yeah. And you're like weaving out of the traffic, it's like full on. Oh look, we have a good break. We look busy now. Look at this. And so my idea was that everyone would do a lap of the Champs Elysees on the Creo. And so the bastards put it in turbo mode and torched my legs for the last 60 kilometers. But yeah, it was like the pain had disappeared. I wasn't stressed. I was no longer worried. It was like I was just enjoying being on the bike again. That was such a high point. 
and it was the first real time that I actually got one-on-one -on -one time with everyone on the whole trip. Eight kilometres of the Champs-Élysées. It's such a team effort, these things, and I think no one really understands that. I got to the end of the eighth lap and I almost <laughs> didn't want it to finish. <laughs> ah, cheers, guys. Yeah, it's a good bloody feeling. Thought it would never come. There's some dark moments there, right? Really? Good job, awesome, man. Yeah. Oh, now I want like a good feed and like not to be rushed. Through all the highs and lows, like that arrival on the Champs was definitely the high point, I'd say, of the the entire trip, and getting to share that with with everyone was, yeah, super special. It's just like one extreme to the other, back and forth, all day, for 10 days. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe this, it's just like a fucking knot, it's a mess. And you sort of just gotta like untangle the mess and then things go back to normal. The purpose of the Amazing Chase was never to try and take anything away from the world tour. It was just to give a different perspective on what the Tour de France is and almost give hope to people that like, if at first you don't succeed, go about it a different way because there are other ways of achieving goals. And I think that's what I've done. Like I never got to the point where I could race the Tour de France and yet I've gone and ridden the Tour de France in my own way. It's special. Too bloody tall, can't see the arc in the background. Your family or something? 